Hello, everybody. I'm Don Woods. I'm the president of Blue Note Records. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was 14 years old, I was living in Detroit, and I was riding around on a Sunday with my mother. She was running errands. She parked outside of the Oak Park, Michigan Public Library and left me in the car with the keys so I could listen to radio. And I landed on a station I'd never heard before, which was the local jazz station in Detroit. And they were playing a song uh, called Mode for Joe. And behind me, you can actually see the album cover for Mode for Joe uh, by a guy named Joe Henderson. And I'd never, I'd never heard of the station. I didn't know anything about jazz. I was 14. Uh, I'd never heard of Joe Henderson, even though he came from my hometown of Detroit, Michigan. But when I heard him, he was making these kind of animal squealing sounds of anguish uh, on, on the saxophone. And it wasn't, actually, I wasn't even thinking about it being a saxophone. I wasn't thinking about it being notes. It was a guy talking to me, and I could tell that he was in pain. Uh, but then the, the drummer, who I later discovered was a guy named Joe Chambers, kicked in, and he started playing this swing and beat afterwards. And the message that came through to me uh, was something along the lines of, Don, you've got to groove in the face of adversity. And I, I don't know what I considered to be adversity when I was 14 years old. It was probably like hating algebra. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the music spoke to me anyway. And, uh, and I became a fan of that style of music. Actually went out and got a, I, there wasn't a whole lot going on on FM radio in 1966. So, uh, I went out and bought a little portable one, and I started listening to the station all the time. And I found that the, there was a little label out in New York called Blue Note Records, and they were putting out most of the stuff that I really dug. And I bought a couple of records, and the album packages were incredible. Turns out they were all designed by one guy, a man named Reed Miles. Certainly in that era, he, he designed all of them. And they had these great, really evocative black and white photos uh, which I later discovered were taken by one of the founders of the company, a guy named Francis Wolf. It's all, they're all really cool. You know, you couldn't see the walls. It was just like these cool-looking guys with black walls and a lot of cigarette smoke and saxophones, and they were wearing cool clothes. And I used to just, I could look at the Blue Note albums uh, for hours, really. You know, read the liner notes, uh, compare who played on, on what. You started to get to know all the musicians. And back then, record stores were owned by like individuals. There were no chains. Well, there might have been one chain or two chains, but for the most part, the owners uh, were different in every store. And the stock in the store reflected the owner's personal taste, right? So every store had different records. So we'd call around town, uh, my buddies and I, and, and if we found that there was, say, a copy of Larry Young Unity at a store, 45 you know, minutes away, we'd ride a bus across town just to hold the album jacket. We couldn't afford to buy the record, but we'd, we'd hold a, the album jacket and get the tactile sense of that, and we'd read the liner notes, and we'd memorize who was on the record. And if we were lucky, we could con the store owner into uh, opening the, the shrink wrap and actually playing the record in the store. It was an amazing experience, and I became a fan of Blue Note Records for life. But more than that, there was something about a sense of belonging to something, you know, by, by loving those records. I, I felt connected to other jazz fans all over the world who, uh, who felt strongly about those records. And I felt I loved the music, but I also loved the kind of lifestyle it represented, I guess, for lack of a, a better term. Uh, and I wanted to be part of it. Well, years later, I got to be part of it. Uh, many decades later when I became president of Blue Note Records. And at that point, it was pretty clear that uh, we were shifting the uh, way of distributing music from the CDs were certainly on their way out, and there was, uh, the shift was already on, that digital downloading uh, was, uh, was, uh, was a more popular source of uh, obtaining your music than buying CDs. And streaming was, you know, looming on the horizon to become popular. And uh, those things are great. You know, I'll be honest with you. I, I, I listen to records on Spotify. I subscribe. Uh, and, uh, but I, I listen all the time in the car and everything. But I do miss the experience 
that I had as a teenager holding those albums and looking for those albums and being tuned into a whole way of life, at least a, a way of life that I imagined uh, existed. So one of the things we tried to do was to find a way to bring tactile sense back to uh, obtaining music, something, you know, making it physically experiential again. And we toyed with a number of, of ideas. Originally, we were going to do a magazine that had a, that had a CD uh, attached to it. And then we started checking out. I, I, I love the things that, that Jack White, who's also from Detroit, a friend of mine, he, was, he still is doing really cool box sets on uh, Third Man Records. Uh, someone got me, Rachel Jones, in fact, got me a, uh, a gift of, of a subscription to bespoke.com, which had, you know, it would send you like a, a cool pen and a notebook and a knife or something like that in a box, and you'd be surprised every month. So we checked out what was going on, and then we tried to think about how it applied to Blue Note Records, and we came up with something called the Blue Note Review. And it, it really took us years to get this to a place where we liked it. And I'm so proud of everybody who worked on it, took a, a huge team effort from uh, the Blue Note staff and from a company called Meat and Potatoes who did a lot of design for us. And this is it. I'm, I'm proud to show you today the Blue Note Review. If you become a subscriber to the Blue Note Review, which you can do by going to bluenotereview.com and, and finding out more about it, uh, Th this package would be arriving in your mail within a, a few days of that experience. I say that, I don't actually know that. It'll, it'll arrive in your mail. <laughs> Might be more than a few days, maybe less than a few days, I don't know. But hey, I'm going to show you what's inside the box, basically. This is how it comes, you open it up, nice little message. Can you dig it? Yes, I believe you can. Uh, another one you get will be uh, shrink wrapped, but you pull this out. Uh, man, I wish you could feel this. It, it's just, it, it's really, it's really cool to the touch. Tactile senses meant a lot to us. This is not a flimsy cardboard box. It's, it's, it's got texture, it's got material. The set is called Peace, Love, and Fishing. This is volume one, edition one. They're gonna be two every year. All will have a different theme. The centerpiece of the box, and you can see the box right now on the table, right? Uh, that's, that's in the frame, all right, good. The centerpiece of the box is a double vinyl album. Uh, this one is entitled Peace, Love, and Fishing. You can see it's a great gatefold sleeve, has the look of, of the classic Blue Note records. E in fact, even the, the inner sleeve looks just like what you used to get in the 60s, except uh, this, these are all titles that you could have gotten in the 60s, but if you look on the other side, these are all titles from the last decade. And I'm really proud of, when I, when I look at all these records that we put out over the last few years, I do think they stand up with the classic titles, and I, I'm really proud of the roster of artists that we have here on Blue Note. And it looks just like a classic Blue Note album. The contents of the record are new recordings from artists on the roster that are only available with the Blue Note Review. If you get this box set, they do not stream. They are not available for digital download. You can't just buy this album in a store or the CD copy of it that's also in it. You ha it, it only comes with the box. And uh, here on volume one, we have brand new, otherwise unavailable and never before, before released tracks by Charles Lloyd and the Marvels, Dr. Lonnie Smith, Gregory Porter with the Blue Note All-Star Band, the Blue Note All-Stars, and that's a band that includes Robert Glasper and Ambrose Hakimusiri, Marcus Strickland, Lionel Luecki, Kendrick Scott, and Derek Hodge, uh, all great Blue Note artists. Uh, put, they just put out their own record that's fantastic, but this is an Ornick Coleman song called Turnaround that is not available anywhere else. We have a great track uh, by Terrence Blanchard that features Aaron Parks, produced by Herbie Hancock, uh, a Derek Hodge track, uh, the great Candace Springs with a trumpet solo from Ambrose Akinmusiri and a brand new piece from the Wayne Shorter Quartet that includes Blue Note artist uh, Brian Blade on the drums and John Patitucci and Danilo Perez. Liner notes by Blue Note's own Jem Kurosman, the longest standing employee. <laughs> Worked for Blue Note Records for 20 years. Knows more about the company than anybody, I would say. I'm a face of the earth and he wrote some great liner notes. So this is the centerpiece 
of the subscription box. But you also get, you know, these are two frameable lithographs of Francis Wolfe photos. Remember, we're talking about the photos from the sessions. These are previously unreleased shots. Is Stanley Turrentine at Rudy Van Gelder's studio. You see what I'm talking, he's not, oh, he is smoking, yeah. Uh, smoking uh, saxophones and black walls and groovy clothes. Who wouldn't want to be Stanley Turrentine? Here's one where you can actually see the walls uh, and the ceiling of the Van Gelder Studios, which is pretty rare. This is Wayne Shorter at the session, I believe, for Speak No Evil, also on the wall there, one of the great Blue Note classic albums. But actually, anything that Wayne Shorter recorded for the Blue Note label is, by definition, a classic album. Here is a copy of a record called uh, Step Lightly, Bob Blue Mitchell, recorded in 1963, featuring Joe Henderson, Herbie Hancock, Gene Taylor, Roy Brooks, and, and Leo Wright. This, this vinyl album has been out of circulation for decades, impossible to get. Uh, there was a Japanese version for a very limited amount of time. This actually was not released when it was recorded in 63, probably just because Blue Mitchell had so many other records out at the time that we, we couldn't put out more than one uh, in the year, so it languished on the shelves till it was discovered by Michael Cuscuna, the great Blue Note scholar and uh, the savior of our archives. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think Michael wrote the liner notes for, the, for this album, and, he, and he's got a little piece uh, about the photographs in the Blue Note magazine, which I'll get to in a moment. So a vinyl, a copy of it, 180 gram vinyl, pressed at RTI, sounds great. Uh, Here's a mat for your turntable, designed by Blue Note artist Ryan Adams. It says, jazz is not a crime. And it's not, and this will help keep your jazz records level on the, on the table. And here's a CD copy of the double album, uh, of the double vinyl album. Now, here's something really cool. Dare I open this? Yeah, I'm going to open it for you. I might even model it for you. This is a Blue Note scarf exclusive to subscribers of the Blue Note Review, uh, designed by my good buddy from Detroit, the great designer John Varvatos, made a, a Blue Note scarf. You can't buy this in the John Varvatos store. You can't buy it anywhere except by subscribing to the Blue Note Review. What do you think? I, here's what I think. I, I think I don't look as cool as Charles Lloyd does in this picture on the front cover wearing the Blue Note scarf. And also on the front cover of the box set, here's Wayne Shorter wearing the scarf. Now that, that's cool. But, in fact, I'm sure you'll look cooler than me in this thing. But, it, but it's, it's pretty groovy. It's got musical notes. It's got uh, a blue note uh, tag at the bottom, as well as the John Barbados logo, designed by John personally. And then, uh, here's uh, the blue note it's a zine, uh, not quite a magazine, but a zine. This month's called Notables. Uh, and it's uh, got a bunch of articles related to music and the lifestyle surrounding our music. The uh, foreword was written by the, the great, uh, great philosopher, Ram Das, great spiritual leader and author and speaker. Uh, there's a, a message from me. Here's a, here's a drawing of uh, Louis Armstrong by uh, Blue Note recording artist Candace Springs, who's a very talented artist, a nice poem. Uh, Charles Lloyd wrote a beautiful uh, LG for his good friend, uh, Billy Higgins, who was almost like a house drummer uh, for uh, so many Blue Note records. He I think he played on like 50 Blue Note albums over the years, but they were also great friends uh, going back to their teenage years, and he, he wrote a, a lovely piece about him. He had a, a great comedian. You know him from Curb Your Enthusiasm and a TV show called The Goldbergs, Jeff Garland, a uh, huge jazz fan, good buddy of mine. He, he went over to Wayne Shorter's house and did a really insightful interview with him, that the, all of which is contained in here. Here's a comic strip about the time Stanley Turrentine, who you saw on that that black and white photo, uh, barged into the Blue Note offices and tried to strangle our founder, Alfred Lyon. Some instructions on how to tie your bl Blue Note scarf from John Varvatos. And finally, actually not finally, but this is the first thing you'll see is that each one comes uh, with a little note from me, handwritten note, and uh, a serial number. You're looking at uh, 
box one, volume one, uh, edition one of the Blue Note Review. Well, I dig it. <laughs> I'm really proud of it. If I wasn't the president of the company, I'd be subscribing to it. I am the president of the company, and I'm subscribing to it. And I bought subscriptions for several of my friends for Christmas. Um, let's see. Here. I'm looking at a list of some things. Some fan questions. How is the name Peace, Love, and Fishing chosen? That's a very good question. That's the, that's the title of the first box. Um, in a hurry? <laughs> it was really, it was one of those things that just popped off the lips. However, there, there is a certain rhyme and reason to it. I do think, although the fishing piece in love, that's pretty clear, and, and how that fits into music is very clear. But I, I do see fishing as something a little more metaphoric than just simply uh, pulling in a, a trout from the, from the lake. Um, I believe that when you cast your line into the unknown and you don't know what you're going to pull in, that's kind of what jazz musicians every time they do every time they pick up their instrument. And uh, so I, I kind of see jazz soloing as, uh, as a type of fishing. So it, it sounds a little frivolous and it might have been spur of the moment, but there is a method to the madness. And finally, what I want to say, actually, that, that does remind me, I was a conversation I had yesterday with somebody, and I, I don't mind repeating it. Uh, for people who think that they need to take about three years of music theory classes to understand jazz, I said, you, you are mistaken. Jazz is like listening to conversation. As I told you before, I was driving around when I was 14, and I heard Joe Henderson. I wasn't thinking about whether you know, how he was getting that sound out of a saxophone or what notes he was playing or reeds or anything like that. It was just a man speaking to me. Now, you may hear jazz that doesn't s communicate for you, doesn't sound like anything to you. I'd, I'd say think of yourself as being at a party. If you get engaged in a conversation and it's a drag, you excuse yourself and move on to the next conversation. Eventually, you find something uh, that's of interest to you. And it's the same listening to jazz. You don't need a, deg a degree. You don't need to know the, the theory that's going on underneath it. It either speaks to you emotionally or it doesn't. If it doesn't, move on. But I guarantee you'll find something if you, if you, if you dig in and, and, and open yourself up. You will find some expression in there that, that speaks to you and um, enriches your life. I promise you. All right, I'm about out of material. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching. See you around.